that's when all hell broke loose. I mean, there was screaming and roaring and yelling. And all I could tell you, it was like scary as hell. I couldn't wrap my head around it because I'd never heard it before. It was loud as crap. All of a sudden, these two trees start shaking. And these trees, these two trees are eight feet, maybe 10 feet apart at this point. And they're shaking like they're in a snow globe, isolated. Just two trees in a calm fall day. And it was just two trees going absolutely nuts. You get a group and try to shake that tree, you ain't going to do it. And the yelling never stopped. Uh, it, it got so aggressive that we actually backed out. It went from really nuts to crazy. We could feel that noise, that reverb. Yeah. So this is all screaming, all while this is going on. Sticks, uh, maybe rocks, things like that. You could see splashes because we went pretty far back. Oh yeah, and we went quite it out. never yeah. quieted down. And then all of a sudden, it just stopped. Yep. And that was it. Yeah, so, it was crazy. Yeah, it was yeah. it was a long night. Yeah. Bigfoot Crossroads. I'm Matt, and I am joined by the fabulous Vogel Brothers. <laughs> Bigfoot Brothers, man. I don't think I've ever ran across that before. Uh, Tim and Eric, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. Thanks for having us. Which one of you guys were interested in Bigfoot first? Uh, probably around the same time. Yeah. Yeah. What got you interested in this uh, crazy subject? <laughs> yeah, I know it. Um, well, our trip down the rabbit hole was since 1976 and, um, literally went to see the Bob, our, uh, the Sasquatch legend, Bigfoot. And, uh, it was at a local cinemas and we walked, I don't know, next town over, watched this thing. It was in November, I guess, snowing. It's winter time. And, uh, and then come December, just before January, all of a sudden we had this thing come through our, our backyard with large tracks. It was just huge foot tracks coming through our backyard came up the railroad tracks across the river went back down across the river again it was pretty you know it's a large river it's not no it's the westfield river uh this all happened in a little town of agawam in west springfield uh and uh basically it ended up turning out to be a hoax yeah but they were tracks that came in through our yard yeah through our apple orchard and yeah. then they went back to the other side and yeah. They ended up, it was a huge deal. We had yeah. people from all over the country coming through our backyard following the, these tracks. And back then, they didn't have a lot of Bigfoot investigators. And I believe the two that they sent out were from California. Who I don't remember who they were. I was too, we were too young at the yeah. time. But there is an article written about it. Wow. But that's how we got started. Yeah. So this thing just basically came through our backyard, left some large tracks as winter. And, you know, at 14, you know, you, you're like the cool kid on the block because all of a sudden the news and the police and everybody's <laughs> got this, you know, crazy thing in their backyard. And, and really no one knew about Bigfoot around here because it was a West yeah. Coast thing, I think, you know. And all of a sudden that movie probably spurred this guy to make the hoax. And, and you know, there's a lot of people that just – fell in love with it and all of a sudden it was a cool thing so how was the hoax unraveled did the guy just admit to it <laughs> yeah it, it, well, it, it was some kind of sort of detective found out yeah the well the guy started out he was a patrolman and they gave him the case and he worked on it for years and he uh became a detective and once he be two years into being a detective he figured it out and uh it, it was just a young kid job just have playing a game. Yeah, wow. but, they, but it but it took it, it took a few years for them to figure it out. <laughs> but it got you guys hooked. Oh yeah, oh, yeah, oh yeah, that got us started. It literally was in our backyard. So we had these. I yeah, think the been been a while. The investigator's name, I think, is Lee Frank. When you go back and and look through all the 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 uh, literature online and the newspaper clippings and whatnot, I believe it was Lee Frank is the guy. Anyway, um, you know, we had all these re investigators like us 
and you know yeah. coming through the yard and all of a sudden you know you had this weird creature in your backyard which and literally this guy who hoaxed it he really did his due diligence because he went he did he went a long way i mean he traveled a long way in snow and plywood feet in <laughs> order to get this out because he literally yeah he, he came from the veterans bridge up a canal road across the frozen canal across the railroad tracks up the mountain to our house uh, followed the creek all the way up to our backyard. Our backyard had an apple orchard in it. And uh, and then went out, kind of out the back way, sort of the way it came in, up that yeah. that valley, and then walked up the railroad tracks to Cross the dam, the crossed the Westfield River. <laughs> I mean, at that point, yeah, that the Westfield elaborate. River is yeah, a quarter mile. Wild. Quarter mile wide, you wow. know, it's pretty wide. Yeah, it was, it was frozen, but, uh, you know, we had rules. We couldn't we couldn't go on the ice, and we didn't, so that's as far as we went. But, you know, we were yeah. following these tracks that were, you know, <laughs> little did we know. It was but it was crazy. cool, you know, with all the hype and everything going on. So Bigfoot was in our backyard, and that's how we knew. That's all that mattered. Folks were not. Bigfoot was there. <laughs> I just find that fascinating, though, because so many people – you have these situations as I'm sure you're both, you know, more than aware of where people will look at trackways and things like that and just say, Oh, well, there's no way this could have been a hoax. Why would somebody be out here doing this? Right. Hey. And the first thing you guys encountered was somebody yeah. doing the unexpected, <laughs> something that nobody would ever do. Why would somebody do this? But yet yep. there right. they were. Yeah. There's stories out there. You can read about it. Yeah, happened in West Springfield, Aguam, 1976, December. It was pretty were, wild. Were there like stories of Bigfoot in the area? Nope, no, nope. no. Nope. Just when that movie was coming out. Yeah, we probably saw you know a, a newspaper clipping of it or something, and came on the TV maybe, and uh, and we walked all the way into Aguam, the Twin Cinemas, yeah. to go see it. For us, that was a long walk in the winter, in the snow, and uh, we were dedicated. Uh, <laughs> it, in the 70s there was a lot of sightings around uh north america do you think bigfoot in movies and things like that had a lot to do with that do you think this sort of thing uh happened all over the place or do you think there was actually an uptick in sightings i i think you know the movies probably gave people an outlet to say hey you know i actually saw something like that one day you know and kind of whereas most people I, we've talked to a lot of people in our investigations and a lot of people wouldn't normally talk to them uh, or to other people about it. Or, and they don't want their names mentioned or be associated with it because you, you're looking at a boogeyman or a unicorn and they actually saw it. And they don't know how to, they don't know how to bring that forward and, and make reality or sense of it. But, you know, we've had our experience. We're knowers. We're not believers anymore. We know it. Uh, it's beyond that. We've had our experience, and, and you can't unhave it. Simple as that. So we, we don't miss. I think the movies might bring it out in people. Yeah, you know, it might bring it might bring it out to where they they can use it, like you said, as an outlet. But they can tell their story. A lot of people don't tell their story. Yeah. You know, that's why there's. You know, I mean, we haven't had a good report in in, in a long time. You know, and it's. Because uh, no one wants to actually put themselves out there and say that. This is something else I ponder quite often. Uh, whenever we're looking at sighting reports to try and figure out numbers and, you know, how often people are actually seeing these things. You know, here in Oklahoma, you still have a lot of rural communities and country folks that don't like talking about that sort of thing, that still <laughs> avoid the ridicule. And the exactly. idea of somebody having a sighting and then being brave enough or whatever to come forward with that information and to take the time to think, oh, well, let me look it up on the Internet. Let me look to see if there's right. a place where I can actually report this to. Right. Right. Yeah, How many sightings do you think go unreported? Tons. Tons. Quite, quite a bit, I would say. Really? Yeah. In fact, Eric and I have, have done investigations <laughs> with other people. Uh, and had Class A experiences and never really reported it to an official site, you know, which is kind of crazy because we do it all as the researchers. Time. <laughs> as research, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, we almost we just don't think of it that way, right? Well, it's almost commonplace, you know, because 
you know, people will scoff or something and say, well, geez, how do they have so many, you know, it's a red flag. How do you have so many experiences? Well, as you researchers, you give calls. Yes, you, yeah. you go on these calls and yeah. you get to go where the where the creature was, you know, maybe a day or two or a week prior to look for tracks, look for other evidence. But you're going to places where, you know, it's kind of like a cop. activity. Yeah. Cops only get called up when they're needed. You know, it's kind of like a squatch report. You know, you get a report, you go and investigate it. Um, you kind of listen to it. You take it on its merit, what it's, you know, what value is in there. And and if you want to go and investigate it, you, you'll, we'll drive hours to go see, you know, for good information. Uh, and we've driven hours to, you know, get junk, too. So, it, you know, a lot of people have variations on what they see, what they hear, what they do. You know, some places, you know, everything's a big foot. You know, it, with so, some people, and and to us, you know, we as guides, you know, we own an adventure business for years, and we were outdoor guides. We went everywhere, and uh, you know, 100, 150 days a year spent outside camping or programming, and never, ever, ever, you know, had had issues with uh, any of these other, you know, like people having Bigfoot yeah. incidences or anything like that. And, uh, you know, I don't know, it's, it was kind of, it, it's kind of, um, most interactions. Yeah. It's kind of like when that we brought those school groups into yeah. Connecticut. What got you guys on the path of actually researching and investigating this phenomenon? <laughs> A trip to the Adirondacks, New York, <laughs> New York. Yeah. The upper Adirondacks. Yeah, as as guides, we own Tacoma Mountain Outdoors, uh, and that was for about 15 years. Retired the business, but it was an adventure education business, and we guided uh, all over. We were New York State licensed guides. We we were all over New England, um, did international stuff as well. So you know, we've we've been doing it for a long time, you know, well over 20, 25 years. Uh, but with the business was 15 or so yeah. years. You know, COVID shows up, knocks yeah. you out, and then you know, because it's a community type thing, it, it, you know, working with school programs, it didn't work out so good. The Adirondacks uh, was always yeah. one of the best places for to me. I thought where it was one of the nicest places because you were out there away from everybody. Half the time, the cell phone didn't even work. Yeah, it felt pretty remote, you know. And yeah. we used to go out there all the time in this one area, the Floodwood area, so we knew. We knew the area very well. We've been doing it for over 10 years. And we used to take all our school groups out there, the whole nine yards. And this one time we decided to take our own vacation. And we went out there for, for a canoeing trip. Yeah. And uh, we, we paddled out, set up our camp, and we, uh, we went fishing for, yeah, we uh, for, for dinner. dinner. And Tim, Tim was paddling the canoe while I was fishing, you know. So he's he's watching the shoreline. I'm watching the water. And it's probably one of the best days of fishing I've ever had. You know, he didn't get to enjoy it as much as I did. But I'll tell you, I was catching them left and right. And they were good-sized fish. And then we... They were three to four pounds <laughs> small. If you ever <laughs> fish the Adirondacks, they were good. You, know, you catch a three or four pounds small on a fly rod, it's nuts. Simple as it's that. Awesome. They're breaking water. They're all over the place. It's a good time, you know. But we're headed into the uh, this inlet. Yep. Headed towards the Beaver Dam. So we go. We we pass this island. We go into this inlet, and it, and the fishing's just as good. It's become a fish story at that point. You're no longer fishing for dinner, <laughs> and and we're fishing yeah. this braided uh, stream. That's what it is. It's more of a braided stream at this point. Can't really tell where it's coming from, except in one direction. So we're going up this braided stream. We're catching fish, catching fish. We get up to a beaver dam, and we're at the lower pond. So it's probably three or four feet above our head. You know, we're sitting in a canoe. And um, now we're fly fishing over the beaver dam. And all of a sudden, we get a bite, or I got a bite, and start bringing it in. And all, that's when all hell broke loose. Uh, I mean, there was a screaming and roaring and yelling and all this all together uh like a cacophony of yelling and screaming noise it, it's kind of hard to put a 
that was this and that was that. All I could tell you, it was like scary as hell. And yeah. it, I couldn't under I couldn't wrap my head around it because I'd never heard it before. All I could tell you, <laughs> it was loud as crap. It it was yeah. loud. So we're we're fishing below this beaver pond, this dam, and uh yeah. they, all of a sudden these two trees start shaking. And these trees uh were probably we went back a year later. We went back the following year. These two trees are eight feet, maybe ten feet apart at yeah. this point. And they are shaking like they're in a snow globe, isolated, just two trees in a calm summer day, fall day. And it was just two trees going absolutely nuts. And about sticks. eight inches in diameter. They were big. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They were, there wasn't no, I mean, we get a group and try to shake that tree and you ain't going to do it. But, but two of them were shaking like they were in a snow globe. And the yelling never stopped. And this went on. Uh, it, it got so aggressive that we actually backed out yeah, of did. the area. And, you know, he wanted to go up or rather I wanted to go up and, yeah. and st- go closer. But yeah. but he didn't want to go. So, was, you know, like the I cartoon just, just kind of ripped the canoe in half. Going I just direction. spin that canoe around. <laughs> <laughs> but, but having said that, this thing, this was actually happening. And, yeah, and it, it, crazy. It, it was freaky enough and scary enough. Uh, th- it sounded aggressive, is what it sounded like. It went from really nuts to crazy, uh, and we backed out further into the water. We're in a canoe. Oh yeah, we were out there quite a way because we thought maybe this thing was going to charge. And yeah, because we had no clue what it was. No, because we never saw it. That was we like a bear beating up a mountain lion or something. I, I don't <laughs> know. It, it, really, yeah, it, it no clue. Nuts. But it was that that aggressive. Yeah, and put uh, all the animals, like I always said, you put all the animals together in a room in, in, in a zoo, and it was still wasn't the same noise. It was crazy. Yeah, it's very nothing impressive. you've ever heard. Before. Growl, howl, yell, scream. Yeah, all together, all at once. It was nuts. Wow. So, so this happens, and it it becomes like I don't know if you're a fan of Ted Nugent, been to a concert, but if you ever <laughs> been to a Ted Nugent concert, and it's loud. And the reverb and the concert just hits you in the chest. It's the just, you, you can feel it, off your you body. know, it, it's like incredible. And we were feeling that from this, this sound that was coming from the woods. We were, you know, way back 50 yards, maybe 100 yards, going 100 yards back in the, the water <laughs> because it got aggressive. So we yeah. backed out. We could feel that noise, that reverb, yeah. that far out in the water in the canoe. Jeez. So it was like, it was... It, I don't know. It, it was, it was, it was, and of course we had no phone. We were fishing for dinner and yeah. we didn't even own a phone. I don't think, you know, no, yeah, so, I don't even think we had one. Yeah. And, and, you know, I work as a ranger. I, I do this full time and we've both Eric's retired. So he just squatches all day. He, he, he's retired. So, so <laughs> I've had numerous bear encounters, black bear and they, and I'm not boasting. I'm just telling you, they always run. I've never had an encounter where it was a, yeah. a, a scary deal. They've always taken off. They don't sit there and yell and scream and argue and tell you and throw sticks in the lake at you or any of that. None of it. They they run. Yeah, this That's wasn't. It. This was no way a bear. It was it was too aggressive. Whatever it was 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 mad enough yeah. to, to to push us out of there. And I mean, the I, screaming you know, we're, not, 10, we're not ones that, that that will take off from a lot of things, but. We backed that up. one. That one backed us right out into the middle of of the lake. We just yeah. stayed there for a while. So this is all screaming. All while this is going on, sticks, uh, <laughs> maybe rocks, things like that. You could see splashes because we went pretty far back. Oh yeah, and we went quite it out. never yeah. quieted down. Then all of a sudden, it just stopped. Yep. And that was it. We finished fishing. Kind of didn't really talk about it. No. Nope. No, we didn't because we all we both knew we had to paddle back to our campsite, yeah. which is less than a quarter <laughs> mile from where this thing just happened. On the same side. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's, the same side. it's just you know a little bit down yeah. the bank there, and this is where it's happening. Yeah, it so, was crazy. It was yeah. it was a long night. Yeah. <laughs> we we get back to camp and, and uh we, uh we had dinner, we had a campfire, and uh it, you know, we stayed up as long as we oh, were yeah. gonna stay up. Eric's in a hammock and I'm in a tent and we're separated pretty far. And, uh, all, you know, that night, I don't know what time it was. All I could tell you is something came through the campsite, woke me up 
And I'm yelling, hey, Eric, there's something in the campsite. What? You know, I just gave him a heads up. He's a taco. He's asleep in this. Yeah. <laughs> it could be a bear. It could be coyotes, wolves. Who knows? I don't know. A moose coming through. He's going to get tripped or something. And so it's it, it was going to be a bad time. And and it was gone as quick as it came. Uh, it, yeah. it And that was it. And uh, so we got the heck out of there real yeah. quick the yeah. next morning. The next morning, we were back up and yeah. gone. We are done. But that's. That's what got us going as adults, really pushed us to, to say, hey, what's going on? Yeah, we this isn't normal. <laughs> we could tell you everything it wasn't. Right. We couldn't tell you what it was. Yeah. But I have a feeling it was Bigfoot. And oh, yeah. That, that's, that's what I believe. I believe 100%. Now that we Monday morning quarterback that experience. Well, we've had a lot of time to look back yeah. and, and listen to other stories and other people talking yeah. about it. You know, and, and meeting different people like Bobo and Cliff and and uh, Dr. Meldrum and a few of them, you know, talking to them. And then you hear, then you run your story back through your mind and you say, holy crap, yeah. there's no other thing that it couldn't have been. Yeah, <laughs> there's, there's just no. You know? and, and where we were was yeah. very remote. And if you've Way ever out. been in the New York uh, Lake area, it's a boreal forest. It's thick. It's I call it the pit bull woods. Yeah. You don't walk in this place on purpose. Yeah. You know, the trails are cut out of these 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 forests. There's they're dark at four o'clock. Yeah. You know, in the summer. <laughs> when the sun is out till nine. So these these are dark forests. They're thick. That's they're not true. something you're gonna just randomly go bushwhacking through. Not on purpose anyway. Not on purpose. No. And, and, and this thing and where we were or whatever it was. was there was no need for it to no. even be there, except except for fishing. For fishing, we were there fishing, <laughs> and if this is as gnarly as an environment as it is, this thing had the. Remember, we were at a beaver dam, and this this beaver dam was shaped like a bow, and then it it went tapered back to a stream. And I believe we believe that you know our good friend Dave McCullough has a, a hand track, a Bigfoot, you know, it's this ginormous hand oh, boss, oh, hand huge. cast. Can't remember what it, it's as big as a, a basketball. So if you, if there were two of them there, potentially, because there were two trees shaking like crazy. Um, I can see you, shaking. you got four humongous sized mitts, maybe straining that water back. They might've been pushing fish and catching fish in that little contained beaver dam. Yeah, we, we were there for them. fishing. And there was fish in the beaver in the beaver pond, so it's very possible. I always think, you know, why would they be there? You know, it, it's a random thing. You 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 know, if you're a hunter, you're probably going to go and wait at a you know a, a feed lot, a water lot, uh, a bedding. You're you're going there for a purpose, for a reason, because they're there for a reason right. and a purpose. It's not the random going through the woods stuff. That's the guy who's getting lucky. You know, he woke up at a stone wall right. when he's crossing. Oof, you know. Yeah, that, that's a really interesting theory because uh, I mean, in essence, a beaver dam is just a larger version of a primitive type of fish trap. Exactly, you know? exactly. And these guys have been around a long time. And dude, these they if their mitts are as big as the as the cast that Dave McCullough has, and they you they've been around in the Bigfoot world. Everybody knows what I'm talking about with these ginormous. Oh yeah, they're the first yeah. baseman's mitts. They're, they're, they're huge. huge. There so you can really scoop the water if yeah. they were fishing. Yeah. And if that's what they were doing, we interrupted it. And they, and, didn't, and they, they got like mad. <laughs> and they said, get out of here. You know, we started, you know, like I was telling you, these three and four pound smallies, they break yeah. the water and they dance and they're, you know, they're all over the place, all across the water. And it's fun on a fly rod, you know, a five weight and, and it's just bending like nuts. And, you know, after a while, yeah. it was a lot of fun. We <laughs> didn't, weren't even thinking about dinner. It was, it was about catching fish, and then all of a sudden, all hell broke loose. Yep. Literally, uh, in, in moments, in seconds, boom! It the whole wood line just seemed like it blew up. Tree shaking, screaming, things coming out. But that's Absolutely that, nuts. That that's what sent us to yep. really go down that rabbit hole. Yeah. Then we met up with a few other people. Uh, I actually had a, a, a camp out. Uh, we got into the Facebook world, got into a camp out, met some people, and. Um, they had a similar story and uh, kind of one thing led to another. We ended up in Ohio with, with uh, the Squatchachusetts group uh, as members. Uh, we worked with the BFRO, things like that. Um, and now we're just kind of, you know, doing our own thing. 
it, it's pretty interesting how different people react to these incidents differently. The the incident that you guys had, the encounter you had, you know, and of course, Bigfoot hindsight, you know, isn't it something <laughs> once you learn a little bit and get a little experience on your, your belt and you start looking back at your encounter, how much more information there really is there. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Why do you think you guys decided to actually go down that rabbit hole as opposed to just throw your hands up and walk away like so many people do? I don't know, because well, we're we're out we're outdoorsmen anyways. Yeah, we owned an adventure education yeah. business, so it was intriguing anyway. Plus, it came from our childhood, right? So this was something as an adult you kind of latch your teeth into because you kind of remember it as a kid, and and there was some yeah. in our mind there was some truth to it. We I didn't even know what a hoax was. To be honest with you, I didn't care. This thing came through my backyard, right? And then we were like, you know, that was it. It was big from was in Volvo's backyard. And, you know, so then we had this experience as an adult, and this was really, truly a wilderness experience encountering what we believe to be a Bigfoot, maybe two, in, in a very remote area. And we had, we weren't just going home that night. We yeah. were there, yeah. and we weren't coming home. We were stuck out in the woods. So we made the best of it uh, by, by kind of minimizing what we just experienced, I believe, by really not talking about it. We sit around the campfire yeah. and Oh crap and boo, you know, figure if you didn't talk about it, it didn't happen. Maybe you went away or something. But yeah, but and, and then of course it woke me up or something woke me up going through the campsite. But yeah. So that's kind of really, you know, really uh, getting into Facebook and meeting up with these other folks having similar experiences and and then kind of solidifies that, well, I ain't that crazy. We did have this experience and now I can't unhave it. So you know, I, I've just, and now we've had many other interactions and, you know, how has that happened? Well, we've got many witnesses with our, our you know, we've had multiple class A's or, or visuals and we've been there with 10, 12 people that have seen these things yes. or heard the knocks or smelt it or something like that. We, It's not like we just walk out and make this stuff up. There, there's witnesses to back up the story. So, you know, if it's coming out of where we're talking about, there's definitely backups to to uh, to prove what we're saying as well with both of you having the the background that you have as guides yeah uh, this is another thing that interests me a lot is uh, i talk to a lot of hunters that have encounters and you also hear a lot of hunters talk about well if these things were out there i i would have seen tracks i would have ran across one by now you yeah. guys were guides yeah. why do you think that hunters and guides and rangers can spend so much time in the wilderness and not encounter these things. It's an elusive creature. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it is. It's there just because it, you don't see it doesn't mean it's not there. You know, it, it's like an animal, an animal, a bear can smell you what a mile, two miles away. They don't need, they don't need to be next to you. It, yeah. And I don't think these things are, I think these are the same way. It's, it's an animal. And they know when you're there. Yeah. It's, you know, walking through the woods, bear hunting or deer hunting and not seeing anything. You know, they're aware they've winded you. They've heard yeah. you. Something else, the blue jays are giving you away. Something is talking in the woods to let you know they're out there or you're there. Something, you know, the words, you, you the woods have their it. own communication and they have a whole different pattern. And, and you have to pay attention, live in the woods, pay attention, work in the woods to see these things, you know. And there are patterns in the woods. Things do certain things at certain times, certain reasons why. And these are patterns. They yeah. avoid you as much as you want to avoid them. Yeah. Even though you're trying to look for them, they're going to avoid you. And That's curiosity, you them. curiosity brings them around. Accidents yep. uh, will bring them. They've crossed the field. They've crossed the road. People uh, say it's being in the wrong place at the wrong time. I yeah. say it's being in the right place at the right time. Yeah. You know? <laughs> What are some of but the patterns just, that you've noticed that these things have? They're they're elusive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. You can't get a clear picture, supposedly. Things like that. That's a pattern. And there's reasons for that. You know, everybody <laughs> says, you know, with with the camera with the picture with the cameras and the pictures today, you should have a clear picture. Well, when you see something like driving that, down the road. Well, even if you're unexpected. standing still, if you see something like that. Your brain's not registering that, and now you're picking up the phone and you're trying to hold it and you're trying to take a picture of this thing. 
first you have to unlock your phone and find the that, photograph you know, get it in there you're trying to figure it all out and at the same Meanwhile, time take a picture it's gone you know it just doesn't happen it, it to get it's uh, one that yeah a, a good clear picture is tracks in the, the right way. place at the right time yeah getting good trackways i'm sitting here yeah. with a bunch of tracks on the table that we personally casted and never once came up with a really good trackway yeah. uh October Mountain gave us, uh, you know, a half a dozen tracks, two that were were castable, and one that shows really decent flexation in the toes. Um, you know, it's not the perfect. You know, you buy at the museum. Look at this pretty foot. I mean, the the cast we have at October Mountain is, you know, I don't know if we can get it here. Is you know, you got the uh, heel back here. Ooh, where am I? Yeah, the heel. Heels back, heels here, back here. Toes up in the front. Toes up here. And I'm, if you're looking at it, you can see the, where am I? You can see the toes, the flexation. They're actually going up a hill. I think and the yeah. toes are flicking in. So, I mean, it's, you know, it's a cast. You know, it's it doesn't do any justice uh, ever uh, for when you see them. And you can say, oh, geez, you can see the toes digging in. And you can see the, you know, how it works. And there's clearly in, in a the heel. Woods, you don't get a clear cast. That track is 15 inches long. Um, Soft six sand, inches maybe. wide and it was a half a dozen yeah uh but they were somewhere in the heavy grass uh th this came this came uh at a uh, time in october mountain where we were watching a potential bigfoot walking on with fleers there's there, there's four or five fleers watching this bigfoot that's a hundred yards away we went back the following day and we we um range finding so we're looking at something now at we didn't know at the time was 100 yards away in a flare so it's a red pixelated figure pacing back and forth and it was just pacing back and forth so it would go like 10 15 feet stop go back go out 20 feet go back go out 30 feet and it did this all the way to about 100 feet this pacing back and forth got off it, it jumped down, headed to the tree line, and disappeared. And that was it. And that was it. What do you um, think it was doing? Well, we think it was pacing. I think it was uh, trying to figure out what we were doing over it, on the other side. Yeah. That's uh, what, what I think it was. Generally, when you're pacing, it's it's probably agitated. It, it's all of a sudden, what do I do? And there's this thing over here, and I, I don't know exactly. Maybe if it, if it was, was, yeah. if it was, it, the it was pacing. Part. Then, it, then it was probably saying, "Oh man, what am I going to do? I got yeah. caught out in which the way room. do I go? Which way do I go? You know, and yeah. I didn't know what to do. And it, there were about yeah. twelve to fifteen of us over on the other side, and we were yeah. kind of spread out along the shoreline. So, in the process, in the, and we're watching this thing. Uh, one of our buddies, Chuck, says, "Hey, do you smell that?" And and so he pulls Eric aside, Dave McCullough. Uh, myself, we were all standing there, and we could literally smell the first time we ever associated an odor yeah. with with a potential Bigfoot, and and it was it was your typical. I had a mu it, it, when it, when they asked me, wet a deer, bear, a uh, musky wild animal. Yeah, uh, I don't know, maybe some. I don't know, but I, I don't go too much farther than that. But it, it was, was something there that you never had there before. You know, and uh, it, you could definitely you saw it, and you could smell it. Yeah, you know, and yeah, and there we were too back. many people there that 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 oh. saw it and smelt it. Yeah, we were literally all watching it, and, and we're saying, "Hey, did anybody get any video?" Because <laughs> these players have videos, and it was like you know, buck fever. Nobody's getting video. One of us hit the video. We got like a couple of seconds of it at the end. It was yeah. like what? And <laughs> yeah, it was nuts. Yep, literally, yeah, you know, it, yeah, happened. it happened. It happened. Yeah. It just happens, you know. Yeah. It happens that fast that you don't even think. Unfortunately, yeah. at the time. But you know, you, know, you you brought up the smell, and that's you know something that I've experienced myself. And you hear people describe it like you guys are saying, uh, kind of a wet, musky smell. You know, people yeah. often say wet dog. Uh, yeah, right. I think that people are telling you things that are similar to what it is, but at the same time, it's different than those smells a little bit. Yep. Right. Yeah. What we are your thoughts on that? Do you think it's just the way they smell? Do you think it's like an actual chemical release of some kind? It's very pot. I mean, are you a hunter? 
I, I used to be. I, I grew up okay. in an outdoors family, uh, hunting and fishing. Well, if you bring in a wet a bear or a bear, a deer, or something like that, a large game, even some of the smaller ones, they, you know, they're not running around showering, so they've got this really musky smell to them. Right. Um, I think. I think when people get the, uh, I used to have a dog that would run up to the farm and roll around in crap, horse crap, and come back to my house and hey, he came back and he stunk, right? I'm thinking, what if what if it was coyotes that ran around uh, after a kill uh, and it's in this elk carcass or a deer or a black, whatever it is, it's dead and it's rotting and these things are rubbing in it, you know, like a, yeah. Uh, in pack, some of these submissive dogs will do, and they just rub in it. And uh, and so now you've got this smell that you can't associate with, and it's, you know, maybe that's what people smell as well. I mean, it's a potential way to get uh, <laughs> that rotting, fleshy odor out there. Right. But you wanted to know whether or not, wh why why the odor was there, or, or do they omit the odor? Is that what you were asking? Yeah, just your thoughts. Do you think it's just their natural smell all the time or do you think it's like a pheromone release of some kind that we're smelling it could be it could be that yeah, where any where, of that's possible you know sort of like like, like a skunk yeah mm -hmm. scare it yeah now it's trying to hide itself or get away yeah. uh Maybe it's not you know it gets uh all of a sudden there's a dozen people a hundred yards away from it it's you know it's kind of freaking out it's stressing uh it's emitting you know it's probably sweating it could be very very uh, possible that that's the reaction uh it could be like a fight or flight uh reaction to this thing and, and it yeah, emits it or it, without yeah. a doubt so it, yeah it's all good theory it's all possible i figure if it can happen in the in the natural world there's no reason why he can't do it or she you know it can't do it so let's talk about some of your encounters some of your experiences what what are some of the more memorable events you've had while out squatching? <laughs> well, that, those are pretty good. Um, there's all kinds of uh, knocks and things like that. Uh, did you get some of the photos I had sent you on the I did, list? yeah, yeah. All right. I, I don't know if you can link them in later, but if you can, the tree twists. Um, that was a, a very, very uh, unique experience that weekend we had gone out another uh group of us had gone out and experienced uh we went to a place called sanderson brook falls yep. up in uh, blanford mass and um it's just up the road for me and uh we were there with about 12 people <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know, huh? brain fart yeah we were up there with about 12 people and uh yeah we, we walked up to where we came to a spot where it was even with the waterfall, but we were on a dirt road yeah. and it was like an opening. If people are familiar with the area, it's just <clears throat> past the Sanderson Brook Falls Trail where right. it breaks Probably off. Not. We went up past long. around it and uh, uh, you, there's a clearing up ahead. So we had a great shot of the waterfalls behind us and we're sitting on a dirt road. So there's a yeah. waterfall and a cliff on one side and a and cliff on the, on the other. other side. So we're literally in this little road that's cut out of the cliff we're sitting on this steep embankments either side just kind of setting where we were at and his back is to the guardrail uh where we're looking over at the waterfall so there's nothing behind him except a steep hill that's it so that's where we made it to that's as far as we made it there was five of us uh at this actually right. well there was five of us sitting there and then there was some good yeah. friends uh Kevin Romero. Yeah, he was up further. Kevin Romero, he was up doing... Uh, Him and his wife. Yeah, they were recording. He, he's fantastic. Well, he was fantastic uh, doing some recording. Uh, every time he went out, he was recording. He's hours and hours and hours of this stuff. Uh, so God bless Kevin. Um, but anyways, he was there, and he was probably 50 yards up from us or so. Yeah, and and he was recording everything that was happening. Um, we're sitting there. We're just, you know... I don't just know, probably midnight. Yeah, with midnight or something. there being quiet, you know, just casual sleep. conversation, you know, sitting there, boom, crapping, <laughs> talking. And then all of a sudden, this, yeah. this, this thing, <laughs> I was standing with my, with my back to, to the ravine. And this thing sounded, I, 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 it, I don't know. Rock. It sounded like a Boulder. rock. Boulder. But this thing was a mon, if it was a rock, it would have been big, 500 pounds, if not more. It sounded like it, 
hit the side of the ravine right underneath me. <clears throat> but it was good. There was nothing there. Yeah. There was no rock. It didn't roll down the hill. There were no leaves moved. There was nothing. And so so everybody was like, what was that? We believe now it's infrasound. And it couldn't have been like five minutes after that, four minutes after that, that there was a rock coming down the mountain right at us. And it sounded like a good size rock. And as it's rolling, Tim was on the ground and he's trying to get up. He's going, what the hell's going on? It was, you know, he's understanding. Dude, I thought this was a freaking boulder coming down through the mountain. This is a steep boulder or a steep mountain. And this was a rock that was rolling down it the was mountain. A rock from a couple of dollars. I'm on my foot with my elbows on the fire road. And I, I'm I'm sketching my feet up to try to get up so I can get out of the way. That's how serious this is. This is actually happening. And I'm thinking this thing is coming down the woods. And, I'll, and then it just stopped. It just stopped. Just it stopped. It was crazy. I couldn't get up fast enough to get out of the way. <laughs> I couldn't get up fast enough. Wow. Yeah, it was, it was pretty wild. But the, I don't the, know what sound, it was. The, the sound that came from behind us, it had to be infrasound because there was nothing there. Yeah. But it hit so hard, it felt like something hit right behind you. And there was there was, uh, and there was three nothing. other people there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not going to put out their names. It was crazy. They, they know who they are. They, they were there. And, Bobby, Gene, you know, we, Chris. <laughs> they, uh, they, you know, they were there. They, the people that were there knew what happened. And it, there was nothing there. You know, I mean, if anything were to hit there, it would have absolutely rolled down the hill because yeah. the angle was just incredible. The thing that landed behind Eric, the first it, rock. And it wasn't anything. It, it, it hit the rock. It hit the ground with such a vengeance. Yeah. It shook the ground. Yeah, you felt it. So we felt it. You know, we looked, we didn't see anything. And um, my wife and I, what started this was, uh, so we had this experience. Everything kind of quieted down. Kevin says, I've got it on recorder. I've got it on the yeah. recorder. Uh, we go back. Uh, there was some guys, who, who I call it Team Canada with us. Uh, it was also a paranormal investigator out of Canada. Uh, yeah. And without permission, I'm not going to drop all those names. But anyways, they were up there and they were having a good time. Uh, they had they experienced some wild sounds as well. And they were in a little different location. Uh, but it was a fairly large group. So there was a lot of activity. I brought my wife up there the following day. And we went we went up to the same area where we had this potential rock rolling down the hill and where where this other rock had hit. The wall behind Eric. It's literally a, it's a wall. I mean, it, I mean, it's a steep, just a remain yeah. back to a waterfall. It, was, crazy. it, it would have left a. It should have left a mark, <laughs> and or rolled down the hill, and yeah. it did neither. It was right. just flat grass growing. Nothing no, was moved. Nothing. No leaves. No nothing. But it, it was enough to shake the ground. Yeah, it was. It was. And crazy. all of us were like, "What? <laughs> this actually happened?" And we sat back down, waited another five minutes, and had this boulder rolling yeah. down the hill. It was stupid. I don't know, but it was happening. <laughs> like, what? But yeah, that's 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 gospel. That's the investigation part. So <laughs> I go back with my wife Kim the next day, and she's she she's deaf in one ear and can't hear out of the other. And it's some of it's selective, <laughs> some of it, but but most of it she's she is she's deaf in one ear, and so she couldn't hear. We're walking along, and I'm I'm telling her, Kim, do you hear this? And she couldn't hear it. Uh, but there was. You know, this, what I believe we were being escorted out of the woods and there was um, uh, trees shaking again. It didn't sound like big trees like back in New York. This was saplings, things like that. Um, and this is a really, really steep, rugged area. It's stone and it's steep. I, it's it's 60, 70 degree, you know, inclines. This is in areas. This is really steep area. Um, so no, it's not something no you're going to walk around and do it. But this thing, whatever it was, escorted us out probably a good four, uh, I guess it's maybe a mile in. So three quarters of a mile, we, we felt like we were escorted out. I did. So I'm just tapping my wife on the shoulder. Hey, let's get out. Let's get out. We're walking out. And it, you could hear it shadowing us up in the woods, making noise like aggravation, not really vocal, just rustling through the woods, just kind of uh, off on the side following us. And we get back to what we call the singing bridge. It was a wire bridge kind of thing. We crossed the bridge, get over to the uh, where our parking lot was, and, and that was the extent of it. 
we got in a car and left. Um, <laughs> called Eric, said, "Hey, we got to go back. We got to go back." <laughs> and we so we go back and uh, go up into the areas. We wanted to find out first off where was the rock that fell. Right. Or was it a tree that fell? There's got to be some evidence. So we went up in the daylight the following day um, and and couldn't find anything that gave us any resemblance of this large rock rolling down the hill. And dude, I'm telling you, <laughs> it, there was this rock coming down the hill, but it never hit. It never showed up. It never, we didn't find a rock, you know, stopped against the tree. Yeah. You know, because we said, well, it's a sudden stop. Maybe it hit a tree, you know, and there was that. Yeah, we didn't, we, didn't we scoured that hillside. We could not find anything in what we thought the area, we couldn't find anything. And and then we, we got into one area where it's trashed and broken up. And we found this one uh, particular stick that we actually cut out of the woods and, yeah. and took it back with us. And that's that full that's twist stick. Yeah, and that's, that's the one we had grabbed. That's a clear, complete clearly twist. twisted. Clearly twisted. Yeah. I mean, there's yep. there's no that wasn't wind. That, no, <laughs> that did not happen naturally. No, and, no. and you know we're there's there's a lot to be said about tree structures and things like that. I don't know enough about it to pick sides and 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 say yay or nay. All I could tell you is that in particular, with the context of the story was pretty remarkable for me to get that kind of physical evidence. I we, there was no tracks. There was, you know, there was places where it was probably, you know, scuffed up, but there was no tracks. You couldn't, you know, it was like, right. it was like uh, walking moss, litter. moss taken off of the rock slide, you know, foot slide nothing on a rock could, moss. Nothing you could cast. Stuff that kept us excited, you know, oh yeah, right. look at this over here, you know, right. what the heck is up there? You know, you could see fresh tracks ripping the moss off the rock. You know, sort of like, you know, you watch, did it. watch a deer walk through the woods and say the same thing. So just, when we got to that, that was, you know, it just took out the, this, I have a little survival. But that was pretty kayak. cool. Cut that bad boy right out. <laughs> and, and that's why I have it today. Yeah. That, that was, uh, you know, very unique. You know, things like tree twists, uh, breaks, things like that. There's, there's a lot of reasons. And I can show you hundreds, hundreds of birch trees that are bent over. And oh, knotted yeah. now, they've been that way for two years. Yeah. How'd you get that way? There was a 30 inch snowstorm, three feet of snow. We had two inches, three inches of rain. Uh, it froze. Those trees were sub, they were just bent right over. And they stayed that way. And they way. grew that way till spring. Right. Come springtime, all those branches that were bent over are like this giant dreadlock. They're just woven into each other. So they literally have pulled and holding themselves down. Uh, just just because of that sheer weight, it's literally bent the yeah, trees and they're growing in that grow that way. Yeah. It's going on three years now almost. And and some of the people that have the, this issue with with birch in particular, it's just probably just because it's it's soft or something. Yeah, the way it deep. stretches for sunlight, blah blah blah. There's all another naturalist story I can go into, but it bends over. These branches get all knotted up, and next thing you know, you've got this grove, uh, five yeah. acres big. Of all these weird bent trees, it's like yeah. 20 years from now. What is that going to look like? You know, yeah. it's right. going to be incredible. Yeah, be incredible. It's pretty wild. So you get some weird stuff. I so that's that. what that's uh, that was one of the pretty remarkable ones because it included my wife as well. I wanted to ask you uh, in your original email, you mentioned a uh, possible juvenile encounter where you casted some tracks. Could you talk about that a bit? Yep. I believe I gave you a shot of that as well. Um, that's the one with the ruler. I don't know which ones I sent you. Um, the, the juvenile, that's that's another good story. Why don't you tell that me? That was a great story, actually. Yeah. Uh, it was uh, Labor Day weekend. Um, what was it, D? 18, 20? Right on the back of that thing? It was 22. 22? Labor yep. Day weekend? Four, five, six. And all it did was rain. We had rain for like four days, five days. And we just said, come on, let's let's take a ride. We were going to go fishing. Yeah. So we went to a couple of spots and for some reason there we, we didn't we didn't stop there. Somebody was there or whatever. So we said, you know what, we're already halfway there. Let's go over to, to a place that we go and we research all the time. 
that's where I had a class A in, where I had a visual in. Yeah. So we turned around and we said, yeah, all right. So we drove over there. This is in Savoy State Forest right. up in Western Mass. So, Savoy so State Forest. We ended up driving over there and it was raining. <clears throat> we drive into the woods. We get up, we park the car and we we get out. We're going across the, uh, the stream. And we, we, we start going up around the first curve and we can start hearing... It sounded like like little knocks or yeah tapping on the tapping, trees tapping. tapping and uh so we just kind of looked at each other and we said all right but we were we were saying okay maybe it was the rain maybe it was this maybe it was that so we went up a little further got up to about the next curve and then we heard things getting tossed at us now bouncing and we're saying okay now wait a minute yeah you know the rain's not going to be tossing nothing at us yeah. so we just kind of looked at each other. We're trying to we're trying to videotape this at the same time. And it's raining. And there's if you've ever videotaped off your phone in the rain, you know what you get. <laughs> you know. Yeah. <laughs> so we could tell you they were knocks and taps yeah. and this and that, but it sounded like rain. Yeah. Rain. So yeah, we had to scrap that whole thing, but we kept going. That's right. And we were headed up to the to the next curve, and next thing you know, the knocks got a little bit got a little bit more, and then things were getting thrown closer at yeah. us. And there was a wolf. And then there was a whoop. So we 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 says, all right, we got let's go back and we're gonna we're gonna think about this for a second. Back to the truck. So we went all the way back to the truck. So we get back there and we're sitting there and we're trying to discuss this, discuss it with each other and say, okay, what just happened, you know? We said, all right. I he says, let let's go yeah, back. We'll go back. We'll, we'll go back again. And I kept telling him, there's a mud puddle at the top. So if there's anything, we'll hit the mud puddle. So we get walking back out there again. We get up to the second curve. Same and next thing, thing you know, the same thing happens. We start getting things tossed at us. Then we hear a couple of more whoops. Out. Then we said, okay, we're getting out of here. So we leave. Get in the truck. We take off. And we, we go to this diner over in Cummington. And we're sitting there having, having something to eat. We're talking about it. We're saying... Oh man, we gotta go back. I said, I gotta get to the top. I says, I, I says, I if anything's there, that's where I had my visual, you know, and I had it in the rain. Yep. So we says, all right. So we talked ourselves into a lot of courage to go back for a third time. So we drive all the way back, park the car, we get out, and we take off, and we just we're just walking now. We're saying, no matter what, we just keep going. So nothing happened. Nothing happened all the way up. Get all the way to the top. We get all the way to the top, and as we come around, Tim comes around behind me, and all, and he, he's looking at the mud puddle, and there they are. There's two footprints right there, and they were fresh footprints. Yeah. This is a, a puddle that's about four and a half feet long, three feet, four feet wide, it's full of water. Large puddle, full of water. Rain in four and, days now, and right Mind where you. these and it's raining as we we're doing this. right where the uh, the footprints are. You know, if you've ever stepped in the mud and you moved your foot, it, it's moist, but there's no water in it. It was fairly dry. So they, we were, we must have spooked them out of there. That's what we believe. But it was raining. So we turned around and we said, well, I, we, we said, we got to preserve these. So he grabbed some birch bark and we covered them with birch bark. Sticks, birch bark. Yeah, you know, kept it off. Made of it waterproof. Maybe you know, it's the best thing. You, you use what what you got. And Put a over it. Yeah, so, we put a tripod over it so an animal wouldn't walk through it. But, it, you know, so then we took off and we said, we'll come back in the morning. Yeah. So we six got up. We, we were in the woods by six o'clock. We said, it, maybe if they're juveniles, maybe they're, they'll sleep late and we can get up there and get this thing. You know? <laughs> so we get all our stuff. We take off. We get up there. And we had no problem. We were quiet, too. Oh, we yeah. just boogied. We yeah. just got as far as we could get up there. So we take all of the birch bark off, and the prints are still there. Oh, they're yeah, unbelievable. They, just a tad bit of water had seeped back into the heel. So so we turned around. We're I'm mixing up the uh, the plaster Paris, and we put it in there. We we get it all. We get it all put out, letting it harden. And I said, come on, we'll take a walk over to uh, – to where I had my class A, which is maybe 50, 60 yards from where we were. Yeah. Wow. So That's we right walked there. into the yeah, there was a dozen out. people to oh, witness yeah. that as well. And, well, uh, most of it. They we we walked in and I stood on the exact same rock that I saw my Bigfoot at. 
and we're standing and it is dead quiet. And it's been about, I don't know, about 10 minutes now. We're, we were just talking real soft between us. And then all of a sudden, yeah. about 80 yards away, out in front of us, it's you heard a solid wood knock. Louisville Slugger. It, I mean, was, it was one and done. And not, seconds later. Not the love taps we had been hearing. Seconds later, there had to be four, three or four such different things stood up in front of us and just started moving. Yeah. No noise, no grunts, no well, growls. They just stood up and started moving. Yeah, there was no vocal, no vocalizing, nothing. but you could. You was knew like, they got up and they moved. You could feel the, you know, you could hear the rustling under the the trees. We're in this area here. Uh, there was a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of like maple trees and green striped maple. So there's a lot of shrub trees. So you really can't see it. it's thick. So mm -hmm. you can't see off into the woods it's it's thick woods and especially in june nothing All was leaves are out but uh you could hear it you could certainly hear it. and it was multiple directions multiple things were moving so and with this is just moment you know the day after we had just been chased out of the woods twice uh, you know the third time was the charm we went up to the top we got you know to, we were able to put the the birch bark on the tracks we came back the second day we were able to cast it we're sitting there at his same location. I, I didn't make that day. I was fishing. I was I was guiding a fishing trip that day, so I didn't have that. I, I wasn't there to share that Class A ex, uh, experience. But we went back the following day. No, we uh, we we, 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 we let's go back to the juvenile track. All <laughs> right, we're 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 standing on the rock. We heard that wood knock. Right, three or four things stood up in front of us and just started moving. Moving. Wow. And Tim goes, let's get out of here. He says, let's grab our stuff and go. He says, it could be bears. And I was like, well, wait a minute. I, I, I says, I want to see. I said, maybe there's something there. You know, it was the reverse of this, the New York story. He wanted to go. Yeah, I wanted to say. <laughs> you know, because I had an experience there and I was like, oh, come on. I'm thinking sour with cubs. You but, don't want to mess around. But we turned around and we, we, we took off. We went over and we, I, I dug the, uh, the cast out of, out, out of the, uh, the little mud. I wrapped stuck them in, up. wrapped them up in, in plastic, put them in my backpack, and down the mountain we went. And now we have a couple of casts for it. Right. But that was an experience that was it would that was crazy because we got we got played with the first time. The second time in, they got a little agitated and they booted us out. Meaning the rocks came yeah, closer. Yeah, the juvenile the wolves became more aggressive, and the so tapping, when we finally got in there, tapping. When we finally got in there to do that, we must have took them off by surprise. I, they probably never thought we were going to come back. Right. They and, and we did. And that I think that's how we got them. They were I, probably sleeping up in this undercover of thick brush. And when they got that wood knock, boom. Yeah, that they, they did whatever it was, got up and started leaving. What what was crazy is I was I was thinking about letting out a howl, and I was glad I didn't because that wood knock was it, it was crystal clear there was no ifs yeah. ands or buts about it yeah, you're in the middle slugger. of the woods there's nothing else out there that's going to do that yeah. and all and after you heard it they just it just got up and started moving it was crazy right. so how we far away were they it wasn't far they were oh. within within 100 yards oh with, well yeah. within 100 yards probably 50 away <laughs> but yeah. the undergrowth is thick so you can't right. see you know there would you right. couldn't see anything really yeah, you couldn't see anything, and it, it was uh, there wasn't like brush and moving it, you know, or anything like that. It was just like low rain ground cover. Four days, moving. everything was wet. Everything was quiet. Yeah, you know, so I mean, you couldn't even hear them walking. Yeah, you know, because that's how quiet it was. Everything was, was so. And this mountain, in particular, this area has a history of Bigfoot. <laughs> you know, it, that's where I saw my class A. Couldn't have been forty-five yards away yeah. from from where that from where that incident happened. Yeah. That's well, how that's that was the June 2016 on yeah. that one. That was and I was with and we I was with 15 people when that happened. Two of us saw it. Other Bunch people had multiple, yeah. they heard whistles, they heard knocks, but there were multiple people that had things happen, but two of us saw that. Yeah, that's the trip in the, I was in the on. exact same place that we got these juvenile ones from. Yeah. So that's how we got the juvenile ones. That was during Labor Day. Uh, I, I want bored. you to I want you to talk about your sighting, but 
real fast, I wanted to ask you guys this. Do you think they're self-aware whenever it comes to their tracks? Do you think they try to hide their tracks? You know, I've I've often wondered that myself because a lot of times you, you find one, you may find two, but I don't, I, I don't know. I think it just, it is what it is. You happen to get lucky. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I, I don't want to go into that woo thing where they go into another thing, but, you know, you know the orbs, you know, sometimes people, the association people with say orbs that they, yeah, they see them in the wintertime, but they only got two tracks. How come, <laughs> you know, what happened to it? And we're, we're, we're the same, you know, we've, we've had yeah. a, a number of times where we can go and cast and I've got, you know, half a dozen casts in front of me. Uh, but I've never had a trackway no. really good. I've had, you know, half a dozen, which was the best that we had was a half a dozen uh, potential tracks. And, and that was the extent. And the Northeast you know? is tough. And the, true. But, true. You know, you're going to maybe get a trackway along a riverbed maybe or through a farm if you're lucky. Yeah. And if that's if the farmer even tells you about it. Right. You know, you know, soft substrate stuff like that. We, we that, got gravel because yeah, everything is hard yeah. up here. But not that, not that we don't have trackways. Because, but to have really good ones, you get into the tough. pine forest. We've got track. We've got tracks here oh, with yeah. heel hits. You know, that's uh, two, three inches deep right there. That's four. You know. Yeah, I, I mean, the one that I've got, the one that I saw was seven. The footprint was seventeen and a half by nine and a half by four inches. Yep. I mean that's a big print. That's a, that's a big print. That's a yeah, that, real big that's print. That's a big print. But we, you know, we went back that uh, was it the following day and took those casts. Yeah. And so we walked up, yeah. and mind you, I, this this is you know the juvenile one we were we shared, uh, both of us. The mm-hmm. this one here, I wasn't there. I was fishing on this particular story, so I wasn't here. So we went back the following day. Now the following day, uh, we go up. And he's bringing me into the area where they see it. And we've got our cameras on and we're doing all of our thing. we got a recorder going. we got everything. We, you know, we're trying to do our due diligence. And we're walking around. It's like, dude, I was right here. And, and it was just right over there. And uh, so he's got, we got the range finder. And he says, go over there. I'll tell you when to stop. So we did the whole thing of, you know, measuring and the tape measure and the whole deal. And it turned out to be, I was 40 yards away from him. So uh, he's sitting there with the range finder saying, OK, stop. And we turned out to be 40 yards. And then I put my hand up and said, how high? And he said, keep going, keep going. And I had to take my hat, put it on a stick and, and go. And it went to about nine feet. Yep. Wow. Nine feet. So with the cast that he has, that's you know, almost four it inches deep in the ground. As, as width. The width of that thing was as wide as a piece of plywood. You know, another day it was raining, so the ground was soft. It was a pine, uh, soft, humus kind of topsoil called duff. So, you know, an 800-pound, 1,000-pound, or 900-pound creature would certainly put in a four-inch track. And, you know, we've got the initial, uh, the landing, so it's a heel strike, toe, push off. And then on the following step, which was seven feet of way, away you actually see where it landed on the ball and it's got the push off you know there were toe marks on a, on the roof but they didn't come out because they were on the roof but we've got the push off and we we cast it both even though you couldn't tell it was a foot you could see the depression was the same weight that happened seven feet away that made right. this so it's basically you know you're running on your toe at that point on the balls of your feet on the front half and and it was a push off so it was a heel step, then a push off, it was and it landed animal. on the foot. So yeah, something the same weight made those steps. And right. how ironic that the day before he just saw a nine foot or big foot. <laughs> so you know, some and two people saw it, and there was a dozen or so that had lesser, I say lesser, meaning they had, had whoops, whoops knock, whistle, things like that. Yeah. All during this experience, they just never had the opportunity to see it. Now. This experience was also caught on a GoPro. And of course, Bigfoot wasn't on the on the video because the guy standing there had a tree right in the middle. And so yep. what you see is Eric and another guy almost simultaneously, 40, 50 yards away from each other. They're not yep. in no if you're watching a video, they're not looking at each other. They're you're in the woods, you're walking 
to where you're, you're watching where your feet are going. We were on two different yeah. angles. I, yeah. I couldn't see him. He, I, I mean, yeah. I was too far to the left, and he was too far to my right, but behind me. Yeah. Probably 60 yards apart. And all of a sudden, you know, you can see Eric in, in an orange Rayco. It's just He's kind of like this, and then he's yeah. like that, and, and that was it. That was it. So, yeah, I'll let you explain that. The, uh, no, well, what else did you want to know? Well, I, I just wanted to hear yeah. about the the site in itself. Like uh, all these people there, I, I assume it was on an actual Bigfoot outing. Uh, yes, it was. It was on a Bigfoot outing. What, why and, uh, were you there and how did it all go down? Well, it, it, we were there because it's an active, it's, it's always been an active place. And one of the right. gentlemen that was, was with us had, a, had, an, uh, had an experience there back when he was 20, 21. When he was and, a ranger, and the history of the area, hunters, it goes back to there's always been 1700s, 1800s. So that was one of the good reasons. Spot. That was one of the reasons why we went there. It 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 actually turned out to be a last resort because we were doing an expedition, but it was the first place we went was raining too hard. It, I mean, it was raining, and then it kind of slowed down. So he said, "Well, let's go try one more place." So we did, and there was enough room for everybody to pull off the road and park. So. That's how we got in there. And then we had walked in and we had walked up to this balance rock. And there's two guys that always like to lag behind because they like to watch the group to see if the group is being watched. Mm -hmm. And there was a gentleman and his son were up in front who had a GoPro. And there was, I don't know, 10 of us in, in the middle, somewhere like that. We're walking along and we got up to Balance Rock, and all of a sudden, right where the mud puddle is, we stopped. And the two gentlemen that were behind us came up and says, hey, we just got whistles back here. Couldn't have been a couple of seconds later, the, the guy up in the front sent his kid back, and they said, hey, hey, we've got knocks. So now we've got whistles behind us, knock in front of us. Yeah. And we walked into the woods. So we kind of walked in. Fifteen people walked in and kind of – they kind of spread out. So we were – on a 45, we were, uh, we went in about 20, 30 yards and I was standing on that rock and it was still, it was still raining. There's still water, you know, the rain was coming off the leaves and everything else. So everything was still quiet, but the guy was in there and he was, he was, he had the GoPro and he was videotaping everything. And he kind of walked off to my, after he was standing with me, he kind of walked off to the left and I'm standing there and. And, I, and I'm a hunter, so I says, geez, if there was something out there, how am I going to see it? I said, well, I'm going to squat. I'm going to bend over and see if I can see any legs or any movement. And I'm in an orange rain jacket. Everybody else is in dark green or blue. So I stuck out. And uh, so I kind of bent down, I squatted, and then I said, geez. I said, what is that? I said, what is it? what's that doing there? It's black. It's big black thing. So I kind of I kind of stood up and I'm looking at it and I and I tilted myself like well, I was trying to peek around the tree. Well, I'm squatching, you know, it's yeah. and squats. Right? And, and it so this thing bent over and it was do it mimicked me. And I, I went, what? So then I stood up, and when it stood up, that's when I realized it was a big there would had to be a Bigfoot. What else was gonna do that? So I turned around and I I just started running towards it, and at the yeah. same time I'm pointing. The gentleman that, that was to my right saw it at the same time. He he saw the legs I saw from the waist up. Yeah. And there was a tree laying down. And that's why he only saw the legs. I was on the other side, higher up, and I could see the upper half. But we ran into the into this GoPro frame at the same time. Two yeah. different angles. You're watching it. Anyway. It, it, it was crazy. And, so and the then we, point we ran to it, and we were like, yeah, after we got there, we went, what did we just do, you know? <laughs> you know, why did we even run up here? It was crazy. Yeah. But everybody else came in, and and they're looking around, and we're looking for things. You know, we couldn't see anything. The two gentlemen that were behind us came down the road, which in the direction that this thing ran out, and they never saw it. And they huh. couldn't have been 50, 60 yards away. And it, it, it died on the exact tall. same road. Yeah. Nine feet tall, four feet wide at least. And they never saw it. It was crazy. And we got two prints out of that the following day. The following day, we, we showed up. 
Yeah, this is where I <laughs> showed up. Yeah, I, I said, Tim, you've got to come with me. I said, you got to come in there. So we turned around and we go in. And I take them right to the spot and I says, this is where it, this is where I was. This is where it was. He went around the tree and goes, oh, man, look at this. Just it's, as clear as a bell. There was a foot track. It, it was right there. There just was no missing it. Yep. So we're huge, looking at it huge, and we called, we called our buddy and we said, hey, you, he's on his way to a Red Sox game. Yep. He's going down the highway. And I, we said, you've got to come out here. Because you know he had casting materials, and uh, he says, "No, what?" He says, uh, "He says, are you kidding me?" And I says, "Dude, you got to come out here. It, I'm telling you, it's right there." He goes, "Are you sure?" He says, "I'm on my way to a game." I says, "I'm <laughs> telling you, it's here. I'll pay for your gas. Just turn around." There was another time we so, covered the tracks. When so the time yeah, we got the pace. Yeah. The so he came out. So we met him out at the dirt road, and when we we're we get in the truck and we're driving in. We had to go into town to buy <clears throat> plaster, plaster so we could cast. So we waited for him to show up. So as we drove in, well, Tim and I'm in the front. Tim is in, in behind me on the passenger side. And as we're driving in, up on the hill, yep. this 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 yell, Raven scream, roar, roar, roar like New York. it came out of nowhere. And I mean, he was it, mad. It was definitely a warning. It was mad. It was like they, insanely. Yeah. It was just another insane scream yell. Like, it was Get crazy. the hell out of here. Or they were warning them that we were coming back. Yeah, it was you know? nuts. And, and here we are going back. Yeah. <laughs> so we <laughs> we drive in and we get out there, and there yeah. and, and we come around the corner. We took we we I think we put something over that one too, yeah. and we took that off. We did. And we turned around and there's the print and the guy goes, oh, man, look at this. Yeah. So he had dental stone and dental stone is fantastic. I mean, the yeah. stuff, it hardens. You really don't have to worry about it. Break, you know, dentists, you use it for your teeth. Yeah. Good stuff. So we we did that up, poured it in and we measured it out. It was 17 and a half inches long, nine and a half inches wide by four inches deep. It was crazy. And seven feet away was the second step the toe portion. but that's where the, the ball and the toe were and you could see where the toe hit the root and literally took the took the bark off the root skimmed it but you can't you know you can't couldn't you, cast yeah it you can't it. cast that it just doesn't show up i tried but you can see work. it but it didn't cast it was in the root it actually is but that's that's you know, how i saw mine I, I, mean, I teeter tottered with it 40 yards away that validation you know, of seeing something and then having the track there. I mean, obviously we have no way of knowing that, well, did that individual leave that track, but uh, putting those different context. pieces together. Yeah. The context of the entire situation. I mean, right. what an amazing encounter. Yeah. It, it, and the witnesses, it, it yeah. was, it was, it, it was unbelievable. I, 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 for one, I was the biggest skeptic going, <laughs> Because I, I, I always tore it apart. You know, well, well, it could be this. It could be that. You know, Mother Nature does this. Yes. But when it Screams, stood there and it teeter-tottered with me, yeah, that changed my whole my whole out, out, outlook on everything. Even even after New York, seeing it changes everything. <laughs> yeah. You're definitely a believer after that. If you can't, un, you can't un have an experience. And once you, once you cross the line, you say, oh, boy, we're done. You know, we, we do the library shows, we do different thing, different events and stuff. And, you know, people think, oh, yeah, it's the Bigfoot guys are nuts. <laughs> <laughs> so, Tim, have you had a sighting? Yeah, mine was, I have had two. Uh, one, I was with my wife. And the, the other one, I was in uh, October Mountain with another group on a different expedition. And that was the pacing Bigfoot. That was the pacing Bigfoot. Yeah. Um, so that was a unique one, more so because it was in the FLIR, but going with the context of the story and the cast that we've got, um, you know, we believe that to be a Bigfoot as well with the odor, the smell. Well, we had um, brought in that FLIR back that night and we plugged it in yeah. to the laptop and everybody was a couple watching. seconds of recording. Yeah, it was only a few seconds, Looping but it. you literally could watch it walk. You could see it walk to the left and you could see the arm, the, the arm movement. You could yeah. see that. But it was too mm -hmm. pixelated. And so then when the guy went to play it back the second time, it was just a red blob. 
It's junk. It, it was, was two picks. Yeah, it was just a one-shot deal. Just say it was anything. But, you know, to a but, dozen guys that were sitting there. Right. Right. We know exactly what we right. were looking at. You know, we saw everybody there saw it. They know what they smelled were. it. Watched it get off the log. The whole deal. So, yeah. So we saw one there. And then uh, my wife and I were, we do what we call a squatch ride. And, you know, we're out here in the country. Um, there's not a whole bunch to do. So we get in the car, go get a coffee, and we'll go off. And we go driving around the back roads. And we call it a squatch ride. So we're going along. We go to this area called Cobble Mountain Reservoir, which is our backyard. We, you know, I'm a ranger. We have 1,300-acre property we manage, which abuts Cobble Mountain, which is probably, you know, I don't know, six or 7,000, which goes into more. another, you know, the state forest. And there's umpteen yeah. thousand acres back there. So it's just woods, you know, a random dotted road or, you know, a, a farm or something here or there. But there's nothing back there. It's, and it's, it's had reports. reservoirs. And it has Many a rich history. So we go we go on our squatch ride and we get down to the lake. And and it's in June. Uh, uh, camp is in the, it was camp, so it's July, actually. Uh, and we're, this is in the afternoon. And um, there's this giant white thing across the lake. And it was too big to be anything other you know it wasn't it wasn't like a sign on the tree um there we go through here every other night at two three times a week anyway all right so we notice what's out there we know what's around the lake there's no nothing it's shoreline it's natural it's wooded and shoreline in some places it's rocky this happened to be a rocky area and what we believe we stopped the car we were watching this i say hey kim look at this thing it's this white thing out there you know, we, we thought it was maybe, you know, maybe a sample crew or something taking water samples out of the reservoir. It was that big. But, you know, that distance, I don't know how far it was, maybe a half mile across the lake. Uh, but but you could see this white blob uh, definitely stood out in a summer landscape, which was water, shoreline and green. That was it. It was mountains. And uh, this giant white thing stood out. And then all of a sudden it moved. And it went down to uh, look what it looked like is it, it went down to the water, stood up and then headed back to the woods. So it was uh, it was like it was probably standing there, maybe saw our car. It was checking us out potentially because it was just whatever it was just kind of facing in one direction. Bend down for probably, I don't know, 15, 20 seconds, got back up, turned around and walked into the woods and it was gone. And that, that was the extent of the, uh, you know, that. So I I'm, I think that was, yeah, I can't think of anything else it would be, uh, even if it was a, a moose, you know, a moose would have had to turn broadside and right. you would have seen a broadside moose. This didn't turn broadside. This was just huge, big. It was a big white thing. And it just kind of, you could see it kind of just this same thing, just walk, walk away. That was it. So, you know, I was thinking, well, maybe it was a deer or a bear, but, you know, they're not going to be that cognitive to make themselves look slim and turn around. They're going to go down the lake, take a drink, turn around, and that's going to require them going broadside to my position to go and do a 180 to head back into the woods. Right. And there, there was no moose. There was no deer. There was no bear. There was nothing. It turned around and walked into the woods. And my wife got to see it. She goes, holy crap. So she got to see something that we've been chasing around for years. And uh, and she can't explain that one away. And, and now, so, you know, it was a far away. It was a, you know, it was a different kind of experience. But, you know, I live here at a lake. Um, I can see across the lake from where I'm, well, not now, it's dark. But, you know, I have a clear shot across the lake. And I could tell you, I could tell you when people are walking across the lake. This thing was a big white thing across the lake, maybe a half mile away. And it was just too big to be to be anything else, to be honest. And we have a history in Western Mass of a number of white Bigfoot, be it at the Quabbin, at the Mount Tom Reservation area, uh, up in the Vermont. Uh, you know, there's, so there's a history of, of, of either multiple Bigfoot that are white or gray um, in different areas, which is very possible. You know, as they age, they probably turn you know, grayish or white, like, like any other, some of the other animals that we do it. So it's possible. How I was going to ask, I was gonna ask what you think about the white coloration. Do you think that's just oh. 
a natural no. coloration or an age thing? Uh, I'm going to go with an age thing potentially because I'm just taking it out of the natural realm. Mm -hmm. You know, well, most of the yeah. things, unless they're an albino, there's nothing. It's you know, a pigment you, thing. You've got albino deer. Yeah. Let's just say you can't have an albino Bigfoot. Yep. It could be an albino Bigfoot, but uh -huh. I'm more apt to think it's an old Bigfoot. These things got to grow up. I have a, a 10 inch juvenile track in front of me and I have an 18 inch track over here. So they have to grow up, you know? Oh, for sure. They're not, they're not born nine feet tall. <laughs> no, they're no. not. No, no. How about you, Matt? Have you had an experience? Yeah. Yeah, I have. I had, uh, over a, the course of about a decade, I had, I had a sighting in 2002 and a possible nice. second encounter that same night. And then wow. I had another sighting a few years after that one of what I would consider a juvenile. Um, yeah. And a few, you know, glimpses of something, you know, that I can't confirm, but pretty right, certain exactly. because, you know, again, because of the context and the circumstances that I don't know what else it could have been. Ex yeah. Right. I could tell you what it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, that's good yeah. to hear. Yeah. Uh, the same things that happened to us happened to you. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, one of the most profound things happened literally the night before I had my sighting. Uh, we were at a location that I would end up researching over the years <laughs> on a regular basis. It, yep. Once I had my sighting, I was pretty much hooked at that point. And it was like, okay, well, I know that they're here because I saw one here. So I just kind of focused all my research efforts there. Um, right. I had a research partner that lived in the area and everything. It wasn't too far from where I lived. So it was a matter of convenience. And yeah. uh, right. I, I thought it was much better to go at it that way than to try to just blindly go to different locations and hope for the best over a weekend camp out. But right. uh, we were it's in this absolutely. location and we were hearing things all around us <laughs> and it's kind of like this dead end in this public hunting area. And we had the cars parked right there and we were surrounded by trees on all sides. Uh, yeah. And to our backs was a Creek and it was nighttime. It was pretty dark, but you know, there was some moonlight and stuff and we heard splashing in the creek behind us now this creek at that point in time you know depending on the rain levels and all that right. it might get a couple feet deep in that area but usually it's just a few inches deep right. uh, i had never seen any fish in this creek <laughs> yeah uh, we call that an intermittent creek <laughs> yeah so the, yep, the splashing gotcha. was kind of interesting so we started it just kept on happening and at some point, for whatever reason, somebody happened to look up and see a rock fly overhead and then heard the splash in the creek behind us. So we all started <laughs> looking up and we're seeing yeah. these rocks come out of the tree line and go over our heads and into the creek behind us. Wow. Well, at this point, you know, <laughs> I didn't know I was going to have a sighting the next night. <laughs> uh, and I, you know, much like others like yourselves, very skeptical, you know, like, okay, what's going on? What, what could right. this be? You know, there's nothing Somebody out here. That, yeah. There's, there's nothing out here that can throw rocks other than people. So right. did exactly. somebody know we were coming out. And then I started thinking, well, how are they throwing them through the trees in the dark without hitting the trees? Because I knew if I tried to throw a rock in the woods, <laughs> I'm just going to hit trees. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I'm, I'm talking to my buddy and we're leaned up against his car up on the side of the car hood yeah and this rock about the size of a marble hits the hood of the car <laughs> and due to the trajectory bounces off the hood and hits me in the stomach and lands back on the hood of the car and i'm wow. just looking down at it and i look over at him and i'm looking at the woods and i don't hear anything in the woods but now i know like this isn't <laughs> like this something's throwing <laughs> rocks <laughs> like this is for real yeah. and that just blew my mind so at that yeah. point in time i still <laughs> wasn't sure if bigfoot was real but i was certain that there was something out there throwing rocks <laughs> exactly yeah, yeah. 
Exactly. I, want, uh, I wanted to ask you, Tim, because uh, my listeners would hang me up by my heels if I didn't. You're a ranger. Yeah. Do you get any flack for it? Is there any sort of uh, commands yeah. you've been told not to let anybody know that these things are out there? What What's the cover up going on? No. <laughs> no. Are you kidding In me? Fact, I, everybody knows I'm a ranger around here, and I do library events. We do other events, and I, I tell them I'm a ranger. You know, I have, and it goes along with telling you about the bear reports. I've been a ranger for 15 years. I've been in the woods working every day for 15 years, and I have bear, you know, they come into camp, so it's there. Um, and it's just one of those things. Now, I don't even, today I have a very clean camp, so today the bear encounters are a lot less. When I had first started, I was taken over for a guy that the bears used to come in all the time. And so I'd have encounters with four or five different bears. I literally open up a dumpster and have a bear sleeping in a dumpster, you know, taking wow. pictures like that. <laughs> so my my scariest bear encounter was in, in Chesterfield, Mass. I was a ranger. And um, I'm, I'm on a mountain bike, actually. I'm going down a dirt road. And the dirt road transitions to gra uh, stone, to, to gravel like. And it, it, there was a sound difference. Now, at the same time this transition from dirt road to gravel happened, it looked to me as if there was a trash bag that had blown off a table, a picnic table in the woods. It looked like it had blown off the, the table. And, and the moment later, it's standing in front of me, literally standing in front of me on two legs, like, holy crap. Wow. And there's this bear in front of me. And I could see by looking at it, it was a teenager. It was kind of long, lanky, skinny. And he was just as freaked out as I was. And I literally, I, I skidded to a stop, grabbed my bike, brought it up. Hey, bear, get out of here, bear. And I'm screaming at him and he's freaking out. And, and we both go in two different directions. And that was literally feet apart. And, and I came back to the house. My wife is gardening. She's doing uh, flowers out front. And I said, Kim, did the bear come by? And I actually beat the bear because he was kind of, <laughs> I beat the bear. Uh, I came back to see him crossing the road. To, uh, he was actually crossing into our yard. Uh, and, the, and she had seen the bear. So I actually beat the bear back on my mountain bike. So it was, it was pretty funny. But that was the closest. And, and like I had said, we, we've always, they've always ran. They've never stuck around. They don't argue. Why don't like yell and want to be around you? Mm -mm. You know, they go. So I haven't had, you know, yeah, bears attack, things like that. I've never experienced anything like that. I have been very fortunate. Um, and, and that's just that. It's So uh, the, the bears, the, yeah, the whole bear thing is, a, you know, it kind of brings you back to the New York thing. Why was that creature out there, whatever it was, yelling and screaming for 10, 15 minutes, literally 10, 15 minutes. At the top of its youngs, ah, whatever the hell it is doing, yeah. screaming at us, you know. You know, and and so we, it was. It was hard to associate. Well, geez, was it a bear? Well, you know, every bear I've ever ran across just kind of puffed its mouth Takes and puffed, bluff charged me a little bit and run like hell, and that was the extent of it. So I kind of became a little comfortable, maybe. Mm -hmm when i saw them and you know you still do the big yell and, and nine out of ten times they you know they smell you they don't you're gone you know if they wind you they're gone and same yeah. with the most of the other animals i think the more experience people have with wildlife the more impressive some of these possible bigfoot encounters are because i i run across a lot of people where i'll tell them a story for instance you know i shine you know a lot of bigfooters see i shine Yep. And people, you know, well, if all you saw was eye shine, why are, why do you even think it was a Bigfoot? And I try to explain to them, deer don't stand there and watch you for 30 minutes. You know, animals typically haul ass. Nine out of ten. They absolutely do. I appreciate you coming on here and uh, sharing some of your experiences with oh. me. How can people reach you if they want to reach the fabulous Vogel Brothers? There you go. <laughs> go to the Vogel Brothers page on Facebook. The yep. Vogel Brothers, you can check us out there, like us, say something nice. Um, and then it's, you know, wildguide1 at uh, yahoo.com, wildguide2 at yahoo.com. But it's the Vogel Brothers. Sounds good. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thanks for having us on. <laughs>